First, I'd like to thank viewer Mac the Knife for his request that I share my thoughts on the events of March 4th, 1849. On that inauguration day, no one was inaugurated. No one took the presidential oath of office. So, who was president? I'm Bob Summers, and this is a presidential story. Set by the last Congress convened under the Articles of Confederation, March 4, 1789, would be the start of the new government under the new Constitution. In 1792, this date, March 4, was codified as the start of the term for all government positions. This meant presidential and congressional terms started and ended on that day for the predetermined number of years for their role. For the U.S. president, that would be four years. There was no time of day specified. In 1849, March 4th fell on a Sunday, and the incoming president, Zachary Taylor, did not want to take the oath on the Christian Sabbath. Both he and his vice president, Millard Fillmore, took the oath of office on the following Monday, March 5th. In what is known as the Presidential Succession Act of 1792, Section 9 outlines who becomes president if the president and vice president are unable to discharge their duties. Some argued that since no one took the oath of office, both positions were vacant. First in line, the Senate pro tempore, and next, the Speaker of the House. Without a sworn-in president or vice president, enter David Rice Atchison. Senator Atchison was elected as Senate pro tem on March 2nd and had been ushering in last-minute lame-duck legislation through the night of March 3rd into the morning of March 4th for President James Polk's signature. Polk signed the last of the legislation at 6.30 in the morning, then wrote in his diary, Thus closed my official term as president. The Senate adjourned at 7 a.m. Since the start date was codified as March 4th, without a time of day, there was debate if that meant midnight or not. Most inaugurations up to that point had taken place at noon for convenience and practicality. This also applied to congressional terms. So were these last-minute bills legal? Legal or not, for those concerned, the Senate often gained extra time for last-minute bills by sending a doorkeeper, pole in hand, to gently move the chamber clock's minute hand backwards from natural time to political time. The hour notwithstanding, there was still a whole day without a president. So who was in charge? The press began to report on the idea that Atchison had briefly ascended to the presidency. The earliest public statement came in the March 12th edition of the Alexandria Gazette, which reported that Atchison was on Sunday by virtue of his office, President of the United States, for one day. Atchison later recalled that because of the long nights in session the previous couple of days, he would have slept through his entire one-day presidency if his friends had not woken him with congratulations and requests for patronage jobs for their friends. He even recounted that Senator Willie Mangum of North Carolina asked to be made Secretary of State. Although Atchison thought it amusing, he never believed the hype, writing, I never for a moment acted as President of the U.S. He also liked to say that his presidency had been the honestest administration this country ever had. Despite the plaque on his statue or his grave marker in his hometown of Plattsburgh, Missouri, Atchison was not president for a day. First, Atchison's term as a senator, and thereby his term as Senate pro tem, ended at the same time as Polk's term, on Sunday, March 4th. The Senate did not reconvene again until Monday, March 5th. At that time, Atchison took his oath for his second Senate term around the same time as Taylor and Fillmore took theirs for their respective positions. So by the logic of a required oath to start a term, the positions of Senate pro tem and Speaker of the House were also both vacant. Second, if the requirement to be president is that they must take the presidential oath, then Atchison didn't do that either. No one did on March 4th. So who was president? Atchison himself believed that the office was vacant. He pointed to a precedent, as this had happened once before. In 1821, March 4th also fell on a Sunday. The difference was that President James Monroe had been re-elected to a second term. So when he reaffirmed the oath on Monday, 
No one gave it a second thought. Well, almost no one. Monroe's Secretary of State, John Quincy Adams, wrote in his diary that the delay created a sort of interregnum during which there was no qualified person to act as president. Constitutional scholar Charles Warren concluded in 1925 that the Constitution only requires that the president take the oath, quote, before he enter on the execution of his office. Warren argued that Taylor was president the moment Polk's term ended, since he could have taken the oath at any time thereafter. The next time the inauguration fell on a Sunday was in 1877, after Rutherford B. Hayes' contested election victory. To avoid any repeat of 1849, Hayes took the oath of office in a private ceremony at the White House on Saturday, March 3rd, which raises another question. Since President Ulysses S. Grant was still president until March 4th, did the United States have two presidents at the same time for one day? The short answer is no. After Hayes, there have been four other inaugurations that have fallen on a Sunday. All four were for a president's second term. Woodrow Wilson, Dwight Eisenhower, Ronald Reagan, and Barack Obama. And in all four cases, in an abundance of caution and to avoid any controversy, all four were sworn in during a private ceremony on the Sunday and repeated the oath again in public the next day. Since 1849, there have been several changes that would alter this story today. First, the 20th Amendment to the Constitution moved Inauguration Day from March 4th to January 20th and definitively set the time of presidential transition at noon. Second, the 20th Amendment also states the term for members of Congress starts on a different day than the presidential inauguration, January 3rd. So there would have been a sworn-in Senate pro tem and Speaker of the House. And finally, the Presidential Succession Act of 1947 sets the current succession order as the Speaker of the House before the Senate pro tem, then followed by the Cabinet Secretaries in the order in which their departments were created, starting with the Secretary of State. If you ask me, I agree with Charles Warren and other presidential and constitutional scholars. Zachary Taylor was president on Sunday, March 4th, 1849, even though he had not yet taken the presidential oath of office. Thanks for watching. If you like this video, please help out the channel, like and subscribe, and please visit POTUS.com to learn more interesting facts about the presidents.